Hello, and welcome to another episode of Dear Gardener. You join me in the woods again today, this time in the Hampshire hangars. I was, I was reading House and Garden magazine yesterday, I think it was, their latest one, and they have a special from Badminton House, that great grand garden. And it was all about the tulips there, but some of the things they were showing were the little box hedges around the south terrace, very formally clipped with white tulips in the middle. And they look beautiful until in the corner of the picture, you see the tiniest, tiniest hint of blight. And it's this orange color. And suddenly, for me at least, the whole scene is ruined. I was wondering to myself whether that could be some sort of reason behind the the well-to-do gardeners, the smart gardeners, notorious dislike of the colour orange. It subconsciously reminds them of, of box blight, of death, of the expense of ripping up a new hedge and having to think about things like euonymus, which no one, no one wants at all. Up here, I can see good trunks with a nice bit of fluting on them. Something you'd find on a very, very, very well done Gothic pillar. And look at that. I'm seeing before me a stand of you going high, high up into the air and sending off great big sideways branches into the sloping forest below. Were you to come here and see that as an alien landed on earth for the first time and told, choose some plants for a stately garden, choose some plants for the Chelsea Flower Show, you wouldn't pick this. You would think I'll keep that thing well away my little fussy designs. Here's the view I wanted to show before I got distracted by that yew plant and the dangers of orange at Badminton House. <laughs> House and Gardens magazine is great, by the way. It contains all sorts of fantastically unrelatable lines like, the boot room really is the engine of the country house. Boot rooms have a particularly important status in, in British cultural life and snobbery. It's kind of a justification for being in the countryside. You can say, oh, I've got a boot room. It means that I'm here for dogs and children and rambunctious fun. I am a true enjoyer of the countryside and a part of it because it is on me and on my boots. So you probably hear more talk in the smart set in the country about boot rooms than any other room. Interesting, isn't it? I suppose it's the equivalent of hanging your awards in the downstairs loo. It's a way of boasting about incredible wealth while still talking about the, the quotidian and the mundane. I've come out now to the most fantastic view on shoulder of Mutton Hill. Here we see off the side of the hangars down to some grand houses. There's a copper beech planted <laughs> slap in the middle of the landscape. It's a fantastic piece of showmanship planting. It says, I know this is the premier view spot, probably for a hundred miles in every direction, the most beautiful and celebrated view. And I shall put a vast copper beach, perfectly, perfectly central in the middle of it for everyone and all to see. Copper beach I have a funny relationship with, absolutely loathe it when planted in a hedge it seems to suck the light out of a roadscape and turn it into something rather dark and tedious. Same as planting the dark leaf cherries in towns. But then when you see it somewhere completely artificial and grown to a huge height, like in a arboretum, an arboretum rather, then you see its value as something to jerk the viewer out of their out of their apathy and their, oh, there's another oak, there's another beach. Something's very unlike oak and beach here. Just come out onto this little, little bit of very steeply sloping, but obviously quite sharply drained hillside. And there are so many little cowslips and a juga repens, the, sorry, reptons, the common little creeping bugle, carpet bugle making quite a nice show together 
It's old hack, isn't it? Doing, doing purple and yellow, but it does work. And then there's vast amounts of little roses, little roses growing in the soil, little wild rose. None of them have got particularly big, so this must get heavily grazed by rabbits, I'd guess. Come out here, hop out from these brambly sidings that surround me and take those roses off later on. Otherwise we'd all be shrub. I'm gonna carry on striding up here. It's a big, big dead ash up there. We are in a period of intense change in the English countryside. In some ways it's terrifying. In some ways it's very, very exciting because we are going to lose these ash trees that have been so important in the landscape for so long. And now we find ourselves at the bit where everyone else, all of these things here, all of this maple, clematis, yew, white beam sticking out of the side of the woodlands, is going to rush to fill their place. There will be battles fought over the ash it's groves. And also we will see views that have been hidden for, for decades. Whole hillsides to my left falling away, giving vistas unknown that will soon be swallowed up. It's a bit like after the great storm, the hurricane, sorry, of 87, when there was something of a boom in great gardens and gardening. Because those stayed plants, those things that people had relied on, the oak that framed the view, they were all demolished, literally overnight. And people were able to think again. People didn't want to have to worry about, well, I inherited this garden and this boot room from, from great uncle Toby. And he uncle inherited it from his great uncle Toby. And so on and so on and so on until everyone was called James and they stole the land from us. And anyway, now they were freed up to go and do something new, do something fresh in their gardens. Maybe, maybe Ash will do something like that. I find it a particular pity because it's, it's just such a good shape in winter. It branches nicely and it leads to exciting silhouettes and difference. And now it's gone. Very good time though to be a, a saprophytic beetle. A beetle who likes to get in there and eat some rotting wood. It's going to be a good, a good few decades for mushroom hunters as well. If we get the, the wetter autumns which they seem to be taking away from us. There's another little woodlander here up here. This is Euphorbia, little wood spurge. Euphorbia amagadaloides, I believe. One of those things where they think, why did you put a GD next to each other in your binomial? What was, the, what was, what was that for? To trip up us gardening podcasters? Euphorbia amagadaloides, I think that's right. Anyway, now up higher into the woodlands and the first beach. Just climb to the top of shoulder of Martin Hill now. It's some um, climb walking along Cobbett's Way to, to Cobbett's View, which is perhaps the most famous view in these part of the hangars. I don't think we're gonna go and see it. It's the one where William Cobbett in that rural rides passage looks out over Hawkley and is moved by the splendor of it all. I read quite a lot of Cobbett. Started this year, I went back to it. I had to read him before for the corn law stuff of the history A level, but I popped back to him, reading him more for his descriptions of landscape and the people. He's a really strong influence, I think, on JC Loudon. JC Loudon, famous gardening publisher and gardener himself later on who imitated Cobbett in being a very, very aggressive, self-promoting pamphleteer. They were both almost self-publishers. And they both went out and did this rural rides reporting, 
where they would take to horseback, sometimes coach, and tour the countryside, loud and visiting great gardens where he was incredibly keen <laughs> on giving out paternalistic advice to young gardeners. If he found someone sober, upright and well shaved, he would give him an improving volume of something or other. And for all that, for all of his concern with aesthetics, you don't really get much critical commentary on the gardens he goes through. Whereas Cobbett will comment amongst all of the disparaging remarks about the, the roughness of the local dress, about the, about the state of the poor people, generally caused by their landlords in, in Cobbett's case, to be fair. He will talk about the sublimity of nature, and particularly in the passage where he, where he overlooks Hawkley. You also realise how much of dialogue in the countryside is driven by nature discourse, and particularly weather discourse. We are constantly teasing ourselves for always starting any conversation with the weather. But you realise from, from reading these things that of course you did that, of course you did. You didn't know to pack your great coat or to pack your, your silky little stockings, which I'm sure Cobbett wore. Unless you talk to local farmers who would tell you, or I think this one come in you know, from and from there, and, be, and invariably be wrong and mislead you, and you'd get it to your coaching in late at night, soak through and take to bed. And what was really interesting, it almost looks like a new cultivar of wild garlic, where you hear two weeks later into the summer, you would see just pewter leaves, that fresh glaucous leaf gone, sorry it's not glaucous, that fresh green leaf gone, replaced by something shinery and pewter. But of course it's just a splash from the puddles here. Great big gouts. This is muddy country, as Corbett would tell you. There's lots of pockets of clay, not like the South Downs below where the, the clay is allowed to rise its whitened head up to the sky. Here it sits under a big cap of clay, grey clay, which gets itself into <laughs> the dips and divisions. I'm going to stumble off down this path down here. It's vast banks of wild garlic. I came up here early this morning. I was in the hills by seven o'clock, a bit before, and you couldn't really smell anything, but the day is warming up out there. And now there is the most fantastic garlicky smell. All of the deer who've been trotting around here, I've been seeing little deer paths. All of those deer have been agitating it in the night, releasing some compounds, releasing some good fragrance for us. I'm just passing a view that would not have been here five years ago, wouldn't have been here two years ago, a view out to a little, little farmhouse through the, the dead stems of ash trees. The forest floor below, completely, completely covered in wild garlic, which might well be the result of that dieback. Anyway, my gardening this week has been of the lawn type. I've been mowing the meadow and I have been attempting to make a usable space again. I love meadows, but I do think gardens are people places as well as wildlife places. And there needs to be paths through them and also seating areas. And around those seating areas, little, little circles, little crop circles where a child can play. There's lots of yellow rattle, the Rhinanthus minor. It's hemiparasitic as opposed to holoparasitic. Hemiparasitic meaning that it can survive without parasitizing other plants for their nutrients, but it really prefers to. And it sends out this wonderful organ, this root organ, into the surrounding plants to suck away their nutrient and thus reduces their vigor. It's a um, not an, an obligate parasite of grass. In fact, I don't think it even favours grass. It likes to take from as many host species as possible. I'm just
just going to let that thing go past, that aeroplane. It likes to take from as many different species as possible. So maybe it'll take some carbohydrate vigor from a really good bit of grass. But then you've also got the leguminous plants, the clovers, the nitrogen fixers that it can wrinkle into as well. And then you get nitrogen, which isn't freely available in the soil. And um, it's been shown that some plants, I think they can be sucking from at least seven different species at once. That's, a, that's a quite a varied diet. I think doctors would approve of that. They don't go for annuals. Oh, what's the point? There isn't the, the density of nutrients in an annual's root. Why would an annual be storing nutrients in its root? It's not coming back again. It's all about that one summer. So they go for perennial plants and they just weaken the whole perennial, whole perennial patch that they're in, allowing more chance for things to come in, more wind-blown annuals or, or rarer small seeded things like the orchids. Passing the most amazing conjoined beech trees here. Their roots really are meshed. We're in a sunken lane and the soil has shifted over time shifted from these plants. Soil shift is actually quite a common phenomenon. Hills this steep, it tends to, to move away from plants and leave them with their roots exposed. But here you can see that trees probably 15 feet apart are completely conjoined at the root level. There is a, a root level at which they completely mesh and merge. We wouldn't know it unless we were given this chance to peer underneath Utterly, utterly fantastic. Oh, peering so hard I almost fell over there. The, um, the roots are here, about six foot away from the ground at the, at the furthest point. It's a very impressive effect. Were you a, a sort of Toby Toby descendant of James and James, you could plant for this, plant on a, on a sandy mound and just make a, a proviso in your will that along with taking all of his elder sister's land, your son has to wash away a little bit of the roots. And each year, if everyone does the same thing, then eventually you'd have great big triffid trees standing on elevated stumps. It'd be quite an amusing effect. You'd probably do something like that. Well, you probably could have done something like that. For the Chelsea Flower Show. Show the roots off on a tree, go and, go and jet wash it all out. You only have to keep it alive for a week, but you're not allowed to kill things at Chelsea anymore. It all has to be completely reused and carted off onto, a, onto another worthy site. Anyway, I hope you're enjoying these solo podcasts and out on the road podcasts. I did and do mean to create more of those mashup episodes. It's just that everyone's so mean about them. All my reviews starting off saying, I'm sorry, Ben, but one star. I don't know why. I think they're fantastic. I think they're a new direction in audio and one day they will be heralded as such. Just out and out, popped from the path onto a tiny bit of road. I'm only going to be on a second. And it's amazing. Suddenly you see, aha, someone must live here. There's horse chestnuts about. There's ornamental planting. There's even an orchard. There's an orchard through this hedge. Little apple tree orchard, looking rather pleasant. Quite a lot of tip-bearing species in there, just doing the last of their flowering. Very gorgeous to see. This is quite a traditional hop growing area. Sadly, no longer, but there used to be lots of hops and oast houses around here, so you get those exciting pointy buildings and there are relics of it in the landscape. We all like to do a little bit of landscape detective work, do a bit of the history of the countryside as revealed by my baseless speculation. But you see the shelter belts still. You see the shelter belts of poplars planted, aging out now and falling apart as, as poplars do, but they were planted there to stop the wind from pulling at the hop poles and bashing them around. Hop itself doesn't matter, 
hop, hop doesn't mind being being knocked on the floor and starting growing again but if you've constructed a wonderful hop yard and it all gets knocked down by by a summer school or autumn school then you get a bit upset so you, you plant your poplars and you and you protect your fields you do still see it occasionally growing in the hedges around here lots and lots of hazel lots of hazel for the for the poles lots of coppice hazel now grown out and unmanaged those woodlands that i was in earlier are pretty unproductive apart from taking poles from so probably taking poles of yew and poles of hazel and other understory trees that are that are allowed to to be managed this is hop just walking past some hop now growing vigorously through some elder and a young hazel so there is the relic there is a relic of ancient industry still remaining here someone could come and do a artisan hop field here i think that would go down very well in our in our world of artisanal stuff i was listening to I, well i was reading actually a very good newsletter by dan pearson who is known to all of you i'm sure he's a very brilliant designer and he writes a newsletter called dig delve which is less about less about design more about plants and in it this week he was calling attention to the damage done by dutch factory horticulture to to tulips they're all treated with with sulfides and chemicals and insecticides and fungicides and then sent out and he made the reasonable point that that those of us who who like to take the organic choice don't make a, a second glance at an organic bulb i hadn't really even thought they existed but of course they do and he, he's been buying them for about twice the price it must be said as normal bulbs and i think i ought to do the same thing but anyway the reason i started talking about that artisanal nature of the things i'm sorry i'm being a bit truncated here because i'm shuffling over a bog there's an incredibly wet bit this bit has had a lot of clay silt washed into it and we are we are boggy anyway that's a diversion from a diversion <laughs> the artisanal thing there was an advert it's farmer gracie who sponsors a lot of gardening podcasts and when i was listening to it was the host reading and saying bulbs lovingly produced from the heart of the tulip growing area of holland and you think well all it needs is someone to stop for a second and say like i don't want bulbs from the heart of the tulip area growing in holland tulip area in holland is horrible it's completely polluted by vast amount of agrochemicals from the heart of the tulip area in holland means from a field amongst a thousand field all drenched in <laughs> tractor spray residue and um of course we don't think that. I'm just as susceptible as everyone else. We don't think that as soon as we hear a geographic specificator on the, on the product, we think, oh, gosh, lovely. It must have been produced by a, a lovely young yokel, or even better, an old yokel, an old yokel with all the power of, of tradition in his horny hands. I was reading last night eric newby i don't think people read eric newby anymore the travel writer and he's married to an italian i was reading his journey around the mediterranean and the great bit about his italian wife they still go back to the agricultural festival every year and his wife does a couple of days work in a local hotel still just tradition to help out and every year inevitably some widowed farmer in his 50s proposes marriage <laughs> to the wife after drinking 14 glasses of cheap locally made wine but i guess that doesn't happen anymore i guess that widowed farmers in their 50s in the north of tuscany just go on to go onto the apps like everyone else start specifying required hip ratios it's quite good there's a different different world beyond the hedge i'm in a dark and quite muddy and shaded lane but I can see out through a gap in the fence through fence pole and barbed wire to a field full of meadow buttercups looking lush and inviting 
chestnut trees appearing in the landscape again. Human dwelling be close. This has felt the hand of man. I should say there is now a, oh yes, and look, a vast copper beach. A vast copper beach peeking over the hedge over there. I should say that this podcast now has a video component. I have a little camera with me recording as I wander. So if you want to see some of the things that I've been talking about as I say them, you can do that. You can go to YouTube, probably to Dear Gardener TV. Um, That's where I'm planning to put it, but I don't know if that's available or not. It will be there. If not, then it'll be somewhere linked below this episode. Just to see a very gentle video of the things that I've been walking past. A few other bits of podcast homework, I'm afraid. We really need to get rid of those one star. I'm sorry, Ben, but not for me, reviews. So if anyone wants to leave a review, your reviews would be would be really greatly appreciated. And as always, the podcast can be supported at Ko-Fi, that's K-O hyphen F-I dot com slash Ben Dark. That address does exist and will help me to to pay for hosting and other things like that. We'll pass a really nice patch of lamium there. Really gorgeous. What a woodland wonder. Another member of the, the mint family like that. The Juga reptons we were seeing way back at the beginning. This is cultivated. Here we see cultivation strikes back into the comfortable world of gardening. Nice foxgloves, very, very subtly done. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous part of this world. This part of the world, rather. I wish that I could spend more time here. It's the hills and the gullies living in Copenhagen. Beautiful though it is, it has not that variation in topography. Anyway, is it beautiful? It is. The people are beautiful. The culture's beautiful. Here we go. Look at that. The weird, otherworldly influence of the vast copper beach, showing that there is a stately manor around somewhere, someone with a, an ambition for an arboretum. Very cool. Yes, other than that, obviously, go and buy the book and and see my thoughts in written down form and get out and enjoy the countryside around you see what you can find it really is quite fun to do those little bits of of detective work you don't have to just do it on the city street as i did in the book you can do it in the countryside and try and find try and find the relics and the future direction because we can't step in the same stream twice, as they always say. We can't walk the same walk twice. This will change seasonally. But also, as the climate changes, as the fungal diseases take things out. Oh look, here we shift from wild garlic in the wooden path to cow parsley, the froth, the light and airy cow parsley. Gone, gone from the dark into the light. Oh my goodness. Just passing a grand entry to a house. And it's got symmetrical plantings on either side of a gate and a drive running between Cobber Beach. And one of the plantings is a, is a very nice native uh, Sorbosaria white beam, as we found in the yew forest. And the other one is the most grand and hairy old troll's mop of bamboo. A clump former, but gone completely wild. Gone out of control. Someone's Old Uncle Toby, maybe two Tobys ago, didn't follow the rules, didn't plant the the washing out trees that we were going to take to Chelsea and planted a little bit of bamboo by their driveway instead. And now look what's happened. It's a very nice bench here. Takes me back to what I was saying about the importance of seating in the meadow. How lovely to sit on that bench, put on an episode of Dear Gardener, Let the world drift on by. With which I will drift back on by. 
I'm going to come up this hill. The pub at the top won't be open yet, but I will sit around maybe. Maybe I'll wait for opening. Is this a day's work? Is this a morning's work? I think so. I'll go and have a pint. Thank you very, very much for listening. And I'll be back again next week with another episode of Dear Gardener. Bye-bye.